Hi, we're back for another lecture. Um, this is the last one for week one, the last lecture that you find in your folder. And so that's a great thing. If you remember the last time, at the very end, I talked to you about um, doing a lecture on the grammatical historical method, okay? And so that's what we're going to do here. You remember we did a survey of the different theories and the different trends that we see in hermeneutics throughout the history of the church. And when we got to the Protestant Reforma uh, Reformation, those reformers, uh, they were employing what we call the grammatical historical method. That's what we're suggesting here for you guys. Let me define it for you. The grammatical historical method is a non-figurative approach, that is to say literal, a non-figurative uh, approach to biblical interpretation wherein the meaning of the text is sought in light of the original writer's language and cultural historical context. This is the uh, model that's being employed by your textbook writer. It's what we're promoting for you. And um, also, just a point of interest, it happens to be the accepted model of biblical interpretation for conservative evangelicalism. And so anyway, this is where we are. This is what we're going to try to teach you guys. You know, when we say grammatical historical method, there's two components to that, right? You have the grammatical part and you have the historical part. Well, we're going to start with the grammatical part. So let me just kind of talk to you about that for a second. God has chosen to reveal himself to us through human language. This is just something that we have to come to grips with. Um, we have scripture, it's human language, and um, this is the way God's chosen to reveal himself. As a result, any would-be Bible interpreter must correctly analyze the language and the grammar of scripture in order to properly understand what it is that they're studying, right? If they're going to understand it, they've got to be able to analyze language and grammar, okay? Uh, it reminds me of a story. The great theologian W.T. Connor uh, from the early 20th century. He was in class, it's told, and uh, the, he and his students, they were analyzing a scripture, and they were really digging in, and they were looking at this point, that point, and they were just thinking about the grammar and the language and, and the context and so on, and they were just really digging in, doing a lot of uh, discussing and so on. One, one of the students eventually sort of got frustrated, and he raised his hand, and he said, Dr. Connor, doesn't the Bible just mean what it says? And his response was, no, it means what it means. And uh, just let that soak in for a second. It's a really funny story, but he's right. Uh, sometimes what we look at and we think that the scripture obviously means, sometimes that is obscured uh, because of language. The Bible wasn't written in English. We've already talked about that. And it was written a long time ago, thousands of years ago. And so sometimes that gap, uh, that contextual gap, in grammar and historical context uh, makes it sometimes not readily obvious what the meaning is. And so our job is to determine what the passage means. It means what it means. It, meant, it means whatever the original author intended for it to mean. And it's our job to get to the bottom of that. And so anyway, that's uh, kind of what we're talking about here. And uh, so we're going to try to help you guys uh, be able to do that. Okay, um, so let's think about a few things. Let me just give you an illustration. Um, when I talk about the fact that um, the Bible wasn't written in English, and uh, but we are receiving it in English, and there's a gap there, uh, let me just illustrate my point, okay? Let's think about not another language thousands of years ago being translated into the here and now. Let's think about our very own English language not too long ago, all right? Not in recent history, you might say, recent history. We'll look at some examples of some words that have developed in their meaning and have sort of sort of morphed into uh, a different meaning over uh, a relatively short amount of time, just in the English language, okay? What about the word artificial? Artificial used to mean full of artistic and technical skill. Well, that's not at all what people mean anymore when they say something's artificial, right? What about the word nice? Uh, comes from the Latin, not to know. And originally, uh, a nice person was someone who was ignorant or unaware. Well, that's not really what we mean when we say someone's nice today. What about awful, right? Uh, it used to mean full of awe, right? Something was wonderful, delightful, amazing. Uh, the word awesome still carries that meaning, but awful also used to mean that as well. Uh, what about the word brave? Used to, uh, to signify cowardice. Well, that's just the opposite of what it means now. The word bravado sort of carries that meaning on today. But uh, brave used to mean 
cowardice. Manufacture used to mean make by hand. It was originally signified, or originally signified things that were created by craftsmen. Now it means machine made. It's a, uh, it's not at all um, what it used to mean there. Counterfeit used to mean perfect copy. You see the development there. What about the word tell? Uh, originally meant to count. And so these are just some illustrations of what I mean that uh, even in our English language, in a relatively short amount of time, there's been a development of meaning. And so when you have the words of Scripture that were written in Greek or Hebrew and separated by thousands of years, well, we're going to, in some cases, we're going to have to roll our sleeves up and make sure that we understand what the original author intended when he wrote that. And so that's what we're learning to do now. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that uh, we can't uh, readily understand Scripture. There's uh, lots of passages that are very plain to understand. But not all the scripture is. And uh, some of it does require um, the kind of research we're talking about. All of it uh, does require that on some level. Even the, uh, what sometimes seems obvious sometimes is um, uh, we better understand some of those things when we engage in the kind of contextual study that we're promoting here. And so anyway, that's the reason why we are showing you guys how to do this. Well, let's think about a couple of things. What about words and sentences and expanding that into paragraphs and so on and so forth. Let me uh, tell you what I mean. Words in isolation do have meaning. And so when we're talking about doing these kinds of things, this kind of study, we're talking about um, looking at words. So when we talk about grammar, yes, indeed, we are talking about uh, looking at the meaning of words. But we're talking about doing more than that. We're talking about expanding that into sentences. Well, what do these words mean in the context of this sentence? And then, of course, you even expand further beyond that and say, what do these sentences mean in the context of these paragraphs? And you go on and on. And so you see that's something for us to be uh, familiar with and uh, be aware of and to think through. This is something that you probably know, obviously, intuitively, but it's helpful sometimes to bring these things out directly. Let me talk about the idea of figurative. We were talking about how the grammatical historical method is a non-figurative template for uh, hermeneutics. Well, um, let me just speak to that for a moment. Uh, when one decides to interpret the Bible literally, it doesn't mean that you should not recognize instances where the biblical writer intended his reader to understand the text in a figurative way. Um, let me give you an example. Matthew 5, 29 through 30. Uh, Jesus is talk, uh, talks about uh, cutting off your hand or gouging out your eye, you know. And um, Jesus is uh, using figurative language. He doesn't want you to literally cut your hand off or gouge your eye out in order to avoid temptation. He's using a kind of hyperbole, if you go back to your uh, English high school days. He's exaggerating to make a serious point. And uh, this, there's many examples of figurative devices in Scripture. And so if you come across a passage and the original author intended it to be figurative, and you interpret it in a figurative way, you're interpreting it literally, <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. Let me give you an example of several different uh, figurative devices that you'll find in Scripture. What about metaphors and similes? Right? This does sound like an English class now, doesn't it? Metaphors and similes. Uh, similes are obvious uh, because it has the, so those key words uh, like or as. Metaphors sometimes a little trickier um, because they don't have some of those uh, identifying word, uh, sort of links to them. But we see things like anthropomorphisms in Scripture, where God's described as having human attributes or body parts even. We know this is a metaphor. It's a figurative device because other places in Scripture that talk about God um, as uh, being spirit, right? God is not material. He's immaterial. And so we obviously recognize there that that's metaphor. That's figurative language, and it's appropriate for us to interpret it as such. We just mentioned hyperbole a minute ago. Uh, exaggerating to make a point. Luke 14, 26 is another example of that. Jesus says that we must hate our family. He's talking about uh, the priority of God over everything, including family. He's using hyperbole here, right? He doesn't want you to hate your family. It's a grammatical device, a figurative device that's being used. Parables, another obvious and very common uh, figurative device that we see in the Gospels, a story which teaches a central truth. And uh, an allegory, something else very common that we see, uh, an account that has lots of symbolic meanings attached to various details in the inner, uh, in the story itself. Uh, Galatians 4.24 is a good reference for you there. Okay, well, there's just a few ideas about grammatical issues 
uh, for the grammatical historical method. Let's think about studying historical context. We've looked at what um, the importance of studying the grammatical context uh, in this method, but now let's think about some issues related to the historical part. We as students of God's Word must come to grips with the fact that God's revelation has been delivered to us in history. Okay. In other words, the persons whom God inspired to write Scripture, they lived and they wrote in a particular time in history. Uh, they differed from us greatly in many ways, in ways such as their geography and their worldview, uh, their social moorings at times. Um, there's just a lot of different things that uh, separate them from us. And understanding uh, Scripture uh, is going to require that we consider some of these things. Um, our understanding of Scripture is impacted in a positive way whenever we take into account these sorts of grammatical, excuse me, these sorts of historical, uh, this kind of historical context, a study related to historical context. Okay, well, let's think about a few issues related to this. What about people? All right, people. Uh, when we are seeking to understand Scripture, we'll encounter at least two historical persons that deserve. Uh, concentrated study. Perhaps you can imagine who they are. Well, one is going to be the author, obviously, right? And then secondly, the original reader, the original reader. What can we learn about our author um, from the text itself? This is a good question to ask. Um, is there information about him in external sources? This is something else that we'd like to ask. Uh, are these sources trustworthy? Uh, what was his education? Where was he from, the original, the, re, the writer, the original author? Uh, what was his vocation? What do we know about his family? Uh, these are very good questions that uh, if we answer them, if we're able to answer them, in some cases we are, lots of cases we are. Sometimes uh, some of this information we know and some of it uh, we don't know. But anyway, what about the original reader? It's a great help for us to know some things about the reader as well. Um, does the text reveal who the original reader is? Uh, were they believers or non-believers? Very important. Uh, if Paul is saying something to a believer, that me, you know, or, he, or perhaps maybe to an unbeliever, that that bit of context information right there could radically change the way a passage is interpreted and understood. Um, where do they live? Uh, were there special circumstances or certain occasions for the writing of that uh, biblical passage that you're trying to understand? All of these kinds of questions, if answered, are aids to us in our quest to understand God's Word. Now, let me just give you a word of caution here. God would not say one thing to the original audience and then say something fundamentally different to us while employing the same words. So don't fall into that trap. Dr. Toller once said that uh, there was one meaning in the biblical passage but it may have many applications. And so that's where we begin to see some of the diversity there when we recognize the differences historically uh, from then until now. There's only one meaning, ever one meaning, but it may have different applications because of this difference in historical context. Okay, so that's just a way to kind of orient yourself as we're thinking through this. What about geography? We've talked about people. What about another historical aspect, geography? You might think, what's what's the difference? Uh, what difference does geography have on our understanding of a biblical text? That's a good question. Uh, but I'm going to suggest to you that it could very well shed a lot of light on your understanding of a biblical passage. Let me give you an example. Matthew 2.16. We're told about Herod. You may recall the story uh, that he ordered that all the male children two years and under be killed in Bethlehem because he was trying to uh, to assassinate uh, the, the king of the Jews, uh, the Jesus, uh, Jesus as a child uh, before he grew up and became the king of the Jews. Herod uh, was a little bit jealous of his position, as you might uh, might well know. So he did this terrible, this terrible thing, and he ordered that all the children, two years and under, male, be killed. Now you might ask yourself, or someone might ask, and they certainly have asked, uh, why would such a horrific, horrific event, the slaughter of all males two and under, in an entire town? Why would that not be something that you would read about in other history books? It's a valid question. And if we're going to interpret this account as a literal history, okay, then being able to answer this question is something that we'll need to be able to do or be helpful for us. The geography actually comes into play here and really helps us out. 
How so? Well, think about it. Uh, Bethlehem was not a large city. Okay, We learned this from studying the geographical context of the passage. Bethlehem was not a large city. In fact, it was very small. It certainly had less than a thousand people living in it. And so with these numbers, it's quite possible to conclude that there was only 10 or 12 at the most male children two years and under in that town. Uh, that's a very reasonable conclusion. And if this is true, though it is still a horrible thing that occurred, you might well understand how it is that such an event did not make its way into major histories. And so that's one way that geography helps answer that question as we're trying to uh, understand what we're reading here as a literal history. Okay, what are some other uh, issues that we need to think about as it concerns historical context? What about the, the quality of the data that we ascertain, that we, that we gather? Let's make sure that it's, that it's quality and accurate data. In other words, be discriminating as it regards the background data that you use or consider. Uh, certain, uh, you hear a lot of times in teachings and certain times in uh, sermons, popular myths that are employed by preachers and Christian speakers uh, because they really make the you know a great illustration. They're real illustrative and uh, it just sort of adds a lot of spice to the message. Uh, one example of this is uh, Matthew 19, 20 th 23 through 24. You may recall Jesus refers, uh, he's speaking to the rich and he says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and so you hear this story about that, you know, based on some research, some historical research, that a camel gets down on his knees and he tries to go through this gate and it's called the eye of a needle and so on and so forth. Honestly, that's, I, I think that that's inaccurate data and uh, I, that's just um, not really at all what I think that text is talking about. I think Jesus is actually, in this case, saying just what he means. He's using a figurative device. He's, he's making a point. He's overstating a point to, make a, to, to drive home something. That is to say that it's uh, because of all of the, um, uh, the material, uh, uh, the way the ma material life sort of draws your attention away from what's important. It's difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, I think that's exactly what Jesus' point is. He's, he's warning those people not to take their eyes off of God and what's important in life and to focus on uh, wealth and material goods. It's a very easy thing to do. Jesus is saying this is very common. And uh, so anyway, but that's, that doesn't sound as good as the story of the camel getting on his knees and crawling through the fence. And so anyway, all of that just to say, uh, let's make sure that we really uh, are discriminating when we, and we use good sources and we do good research whenever we're gathering historical data to inform us and our biblical interpretation. Let's, let's be very careful there and be discriminating, okay? And then also, too, let's just don't miss the point. After having said all of this about uh, picking up my Bible, having said all of this about um, grammatical principles and historical principles, uh, let's don't miss the point of the passage. Let me read you something really quick. Luke 18, 9 through 14. 9 through 14. This is a parable that Jesus tells. And he says, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, uh, that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men uh, went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like the tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all I get, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That last line, everyone um, who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That line, that's the point of the passage. Okay, And so when we do grammatical uh, studies and historical studies, this will help us to better understand this parable. But let me tell you something, don't miss the point. Okay, uh, If we do that, then, then all of this will have been for no reason. So all of these particular contextual studies will, will prop up and aid us as we try to better understand Scripture. But let's don't miss the point. So anyway, hopefully this brief 
uh, lecture on the grammatical historical method will be a help to you, will be a companion to your, uh, to your reading. And, um, and uh, until next time, week two, week one's over, so now we move to week two. Good luck.